Um, well, welcome everyone to day two of Shaping EDU Winter Games 2021. This session is Riding the Chairlift, a bird's eye view to navigating the digital divide. My name is Christina No, and I am your Zoom host. Uh, Ashley Gornitz is our Zoom monitor. She will be watching our Zoom room for any technology needs or support. We'd also like uh, to remind you to rename yourself your first name, your last name, your title, and your ASU unit or office. Uh, and if you are external to ASU, your organization, if you haven't already. And with that, I will hand it over to our tremendous uh, presenter. Great, thank you so much, Christina. Um, we are excited to talk with you all today about the digital divide um, and trying to take a bird's eye view. We played along with winter games and thought we'd take that from the chairlift. Um, so first we'd like to just introduce ourselves um, and at the same time, we'd also ask that you begin to introduce yourselves in the chat. So feel free um, to just post in the chat kind of who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. Um, and then we're also going to have a poll that Ashley will put up very shortly, um, just so we can learn a little bit more about how you identify your role um, and how you work at your organization. Um, in the meantime, I'll share a little bit about our office. So the Office of Applied Innovation identifies and applies emerging science, technology, design, and policy innovations to advance educational access, as well as economic opportunity in the communities that Arizona State University serves. So we're a special projects unit at ASU. And within our office, in addition to staff who work on a great number of projects around that mission, we have a growing student design studio that brings together an interdisciplinary team of undergraduate and graduate students to, to design and advance their own projects. So I have several of those students joining me today, um, and I'm going to pass it off to Faith to introduce herself. Hello. So like Michelle mentioned, I am a student that works with the Office of Applied Innovation as a student innovation analyst. I am also a senior here at ASU and my academic background informs a lot of the projects that I work on because I am majoring in both business, public service and public policy as well as educational studies. My work within the office as well as my studies largely examine educational inequities and propose solutions based on policy to create sustainable and long-term change. I am very interested in how we can continue to leverage technology and science to expand learning opportunities both in and out of a formal classroom to better engage and transform our communities. And I will pass it to Jasmine. Hi, my name is Jasmine and like Faith, I'm also an innovation analyst with the Office of Applied Innovation. Um, I'm also in my second year of studying mechanical engineering with a focus in energy and environmental studies. And I'll pass it to Bailey. Hi everybody, my name is Bailey and I'm also a student innovation analyst in the Office of Applied Innovation. Um, I'm a sophomore student at ASU studying elementary education with a certificate in cross-sector leadership. Um, my work in the Office of Applied Innovation largely revolves around education policy and reform and strongly correlates to what I'm studying in school and my goals um, for post-college of becoming a teacher and hopefully later moving into the education policy realm and or administration. Um, today I'm interested in conversing around how we can use technology and science not really as a substitute in place of dealing with reform, but rather how we can use those things to handle those systemic changes. Um, and I'm super excited for this presentation today. Great, thank you team. And then my name is Michelle, I'm Director of Strategy and Partnerships and I work very closely with the students. I learn a lot from them. My background is in science and technology policy. Um, so the foundational questions in my work are how do we um, invest in and organize science and technology for public values outcomes. Um, and around higher education, I like to think about how we leverage science and technology for dealing with the challenges that we face both in systems um, and just in um, for individuals as well. So we are excited to talk with you all today and Faith is gonna run through our agenda. So as you ride the chairlift with us today and look down at the digital divide, there'll be several topics that we touch on. We will first begin by defining what we view as the digital divide and that will inform the rest of our presentation. After that, we will move on to questioning exactly how digital is the digital divide after that, we will touch briefly on what's the opposite of techno-optimism, and don't worry if you don't know that term, we will go on and define it for you. And lastly, we will reflect back as we reach the summit with our chairlist on what exactly we've talked about today and what you can take away from this conversation. Please keep in mind that throughout this presentation, there will be opportunities for you to engage with us and the material 
through various chat questions and polls, so be prepared. Thank you. Alrighty, so we're going to start by defining the digital divide and Jasmine is going to pop a question into the chat for us to do some reflection on. So I'll give you all a few minutes to think about how you define the digital divide and how your work perhaps encounters the digital divide. So Pauline is sharing inequality. Christina, our room host, previously worked with Verizon Foundation to think through challenges to tech access in rural communities. Thank you, Laura, for sharing access or fluency in digital skills or technology. And then James is sharing that he would define the digital divide as the disparity between different socioeconomic groups regarding how much access, how much comfort or fluency they feel with accessing and using digital technology. So for the sake of time, these are all really great to start with. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we, um, in our research, have found um, that this is kind of the most general of definition, I think really fits with what many of you shared, um, that the digital divide is about the gap between those with the access, and not just access, but also the means, the knowledge, some of you shared skills, um, to benefit from internet technology, different people divide or de define what sort of digital um, access or entity we're accessing, um, but it's the gap between those with that access and those without. And of course, this is, as many of you have already indicated in the chat, a multifaceted, um, it, a multifaceted idea. So the first thing that comes up most often is this idea of possession of or access to devices. Um, and one scholar that we like to follow, Justin Reich, um, he actually likes to think about the device access question as not a digital divide, but a digital fault line. Um, so fault lines exist between mountains. There's two mountains on this page um, and fault lines shift over time. That's how mountain ranges rise and fall. And he says that with every different device or different technological capability, internet, laptops, even the types of software that you might have on your phone or your laptop or your device, um, there are different types of gaps. So for example, those who experienced a gap around access to a device might not be the same people or experience the gap the same when we're talking about access to a particular software, access to a broadband connection. So that alone, the idea of access is already a multifaceted sort of more complex idea than it might appear at first. And then of course, as many of you have already indicated, there's this idea of skills. Um, so once you have a device, once you have a connection, do you have the skills to use it or how are you using it? which goes into use um, in many of the research studies that we examined in use in education settings, for example. You find that in lower income schools or schools with a higher proportion of um, reduced or free lunch, that students are often using technology to do more basic drills. Whereas in schools that are from more affluent communities tend to use technology for more complex problem solving, programming, um, special activities like that. So there's even a divide in use. Um, there's also attitudes or perceptions. Um, one very important point here is around trust. Um, so Cox has a co Compete to Connect program that runs across the country and they found that in communities that are surveyed, those with higher levels of trust are quicker to adopt and those with higher levels of distrust often experience the digital divide for longer or more broadly throughout their community. Um, and then finally, there's also the social consequences of use. So as more of our social interactions um, are taking place in a digital setting, and the pandemic, of course, but even before that with social networks, for example, um, there are also gaps around even our ability um, to hold, sustain, or build social capital. Um, and of course, all of those can be experienced differently across a variety of variables. I won't go through all of them right now, but I'd like you to keep an eye out for them in reflecting on your own experience and then also in the examples that we share today. Took me a while to find the unmute button. Sorry about that. Uh, so Michelle did a great job at breaking down uh, the various gaps that lead to a digital divide. And one of the central factors that she spoke about was um, possession or access to devices. And in tribal communities, um, the digital divide not only materializes in lack of possession to devices, but also um, 
in possession of basic utilities such as electricity, running water, um, and in the Navajo Nation, 10% of homes lack electricity, 60% don't have landline telephone service, and 33% are relying on internet from their smartphone connections that aren't quite uh, reliable enough to be used for remote work or remote learning. And these inequities exist for a number of reasons. So firstly, tribal communities are often rural, have houses that are spaced far apart, which means it's harder co to connect them to the power grid. In fact, on average, it uh, costs $40,000 to connect one home to the power grid. Um, furthermore, because people often lack access to broadband or electricity um, at home. They have to drive to get Wi-Fi from a school or hotel parking lots, which can be far away given that it's quite rural. And then finally, tribal communities can face additional barriers in receiving the necessary funding to gain access to electricity devices and broadband because of various jurisdictional issues um, around tribal, state, and federal funding. Um, and I just wanna note real quick, uh, though COVID-19 has definitely put a spotlight on the digital divide in tribal communities. Um, it is also important to note that this issue did precede COVID and will likely be exacerbated by the pandemic. So a second population that's been impacted by the digital divide even before COVID as well is K-12 students, teachers, and administrators. Um, and identified in the literature around this space, there's been three necessities for successful remote learning. And the first one is broadband access. 14% um, of children's ages um, 3 through 18 don't have internet access at home at all, and 18% of rural households don't have internet access as well. And it's also important to note that these numbers do vary by race. Um, it's been found that white and Asian students tend to have above average broadband access, where um, Black, Hispanic, and American Indian and Native Alaskan children usually have below average access. Um, the second necessity is uh, working devices. 17% of students ages three through 18 live in households without a laptop or desktop computer. Um, and 11 million students don't have a computer for online learning at all. And third, and possibly one of the most relevant ones today is the functional skills to work technology. Um, the digital divide in K-12, especially nowadays, is becoming less defined by the have or have not and more defined by the can or cannot. Um, especially during the pandemic, students are increasingly given access to devices and broadband, um, but tend to lack the skills to properly use them. Um, as you may have guessed, unfortunately, the students who can navigate the internet successfully usually come from more affluent homes and attend schools where technology is abundant in the classroom and often used properly. Students who cannot navigate the internet successfully typically attend schools with, um, or that lack of appropriate infrastructure to support the necessary bandwidth, um, and their budgets usually don't allow for consistent IT support. Um, the use of technology in the classroom also seems to be following a similar inequitable pattern of the achievement or opportunity gap between students of different cultural, linguistic, and economic backgrounds, which is important to note as well. And popped up on the slide here, I um, wanna talk about the pre-COVID-19 impact of the digital divide in K-12 schools because it did exist before remote learning became the norm. Um, some students had to complete online homework assignments outside of their homes at places like library and cafes. Um, and these places aren't really open today, so that's a big problem as well. Um, digital literacy was something that affected um, students um, just because those such sorts of skills are necessary for things like applying to college, applying for scholarships, et cetera. Um, and students actually, or studies actually show that students with access to the internet tend to perform better academically. Um, as for post-COVID impact of the um, digital divide, Obviously, the pandemic has exacerbated the impact of the digital divide um, because students no longer have that access to physical school buildings and they have to engage in class if they're going to engage in class at all remotely. So um, the digital divide post-COVID made these existing inequalities go from bad to worse, essentially, by disproportionately affecting certain geographic areas and certain groups such as low-income students. Um, funding also may not exist for public schools to provide technology on top of the education they're providing for students. And if schools are able to distribute devices, there's no guarantee that certain households actually have um, broadband access at home. And wealthier school districts are, also, are, are able to solve technological issues faster than lower income districts, which just kind of adds to that inequitable um, aspect of the digital divide. And lastly, um, all of this just kind of adds to that COVID slide that we've heard so much about, um, which will impact students um, far beyond the end of the pandemic.
So my point is going to center around a digital divide in higher education. However, many of the issues that both ba Bailey and Jasmine highlighted extend to higher education as well, something I think many of us can probably speak to. Offerings on a virtual scale to learners are only as effective and impactful as the amount of people that they can reach. And that is something that has definitely continued to be highlighted over the course of the past year with COVID-19. Um, some of the critical challenges that have developed the digital divide in higher education include college access, technological capabilities, and the disenfranchisement of students. So Bailey touched on the idea of digital literacy as well as access to technology for K-12 education. And obviously, in order for you to reach higher education, you go through that system first. And something that's very notable is students who have access consistently and also have knowledge of uh, what digital fluency and literacy looks like actually have huge impacts on their college selection, applications, admissions, and financial aid process. A recent study uh, compared urban public school students to their private school counterparts and found that because the public school students had this foundational lack of access to digital technologies, that they were not as um, involved in the college selection and application process and also sometimes missed out on important opportunities and deadlines for financial aid and admissions. And this can just exacerbate an already uneven playing field in higher education with what communities and populations make up a majority of our student body. Once they enter higher education, be it college or a university, there's a host of new problems that can face these students. In the US alone, 20% of students don't have the technological capabilities they need for online or in-person hybrid education. Uh, students from low-income families and students of color are the disproportionate populations that are impacted by this. In Virginia, nearly 4% of college students don't have a home computer. And while 4% doesn't seem like a large number, it is actually 23,000 students. And if you multiply that across the 50 states that we have, it is roughly equal to 1,150,000 students. Um, and that is on the lower end saying that every, every state only has 4% of their student body population not having a home computer. And when something like COVID happens, um, oftentimes not having a home computer device leads to huge issues with what schoolwork students are able to complete, um, if they're able to sign up for classes, and can unfortunately grow the population that we have already in the US of people who have some college but no college degree because they're unable to complete their degree program. I think it's also important to note that students who are traditionally disenfranchised with the educational process, which is largely, once again, those who are in low socioeconomic areas or have a lower socioeconomic background or who might be students of color, are actually more likely than their peers to have limited access to technology, technological resources that are necessary to completing their education. Um, this is exacerbated when public spaces like libraries and school computer labs may be closed or have additional barriers of access during a pandemic. And unfortunately, it fuels existing inequities and can cause specific populations in our communities to no longer attend higher education. Colleges and universities have obviously taken steps to having a solution for this challenge for these challenges. Unfortunately, not all solutions are created equal. Um, one that we saw really occur during COVID-19 and that has been in play for a while is the idea of loaning out devices. Unfortunately, loaning devices only addresses one section or one problem, and that is access to device. It doesn't solve the issues that may come up with students needing to stay online, crashing apps, patchy service and systems malfunction that all can lead to loaned out devices not being used as much as they could be and to students eventually still not completing their higher education journey. Schools try to solve part of that problem by expanding their broadband or giving students hotspots. But something that we've seen across the US in the past year is the fact that often demand for these solutions outstrips the supply. Even when we partner with large technology firms, um, it just doesn't really match up, unfortunately, because there's too many students who still have a need. Other solutions that higher education has begun exploring include the idea of building in a fee. Um, something that was found is that student activity fees may not always be necessary, like in a pandemic, um, but IT is always a necessary expense for schools and is a strong foundation for having all students have access to the materials they need. Alternatively, universities have also started to look into the idea of removing the cost of books by loaning out devices that are preloaded with content that can be accessed both online and offline. None of the solutions I've mentioned today are perfect solutions, but it is important for colleges and universities to continually think of new and innovative ways to address the digital divide. 
in part because it existed before the pandemic and will continue to be exacerbated by the pandemic. And if it's left unaddressed or is not addressed in full, it will only grow worse after the pandemic. Thank you, Faith. So as all um, three of you noted in your examples, the pandemic has um, put a spotlight on um, the disparities that we see, but it's also created opportunities to respond to it. Um, and so we don't wanna put you under the impression that this whole presentation will be about dwelling on the challenges, though the challenges are real and multifaceted, and they're also experienced differently um, by people from different backgrounds or different income levels. For example, this graph showing that those from lower income households are more, more likely to have to use devices such as cell phones versus laptops, are more likely not to have an access or access to a computer at home, and are also more likely to encounter more um, than one of these obstacles at a time. Um, but we do want to kind of go into one of the practices that we have in our office, which is about getting the problem right. Um, so not just seeing it as a digital problem, but seeing it as this fuller problem. And so first we'd love um, in the chat, if you all would love to share an example or multiple examples in which you've encountered a non-digital aspect of the digital divide, or maybe share what outside factors you've seen having an impact on interactions with and through technology. Um, so we'll give you some time to share that and Bailey put the question in the chat as well. Um, and then we, we in the next several slides are gonna go through some of those other aspects besides the technology, besides the access um, to that technology that we like to think about in our work. And Christina starts us off with a pandemic <laughs> as a non-technical aspect of the digital divide. Absolutely. Jeff um, Miller, excellent point about the home itself not always being a safe space or a good space for some learners. Um, I've encountered my own students that maybe have multiple siblings in the same room trying to do work, um, for example. And Christina, we're actually gonna talk about funding. So we'll let you all continue to add things to the chat. Thank you, James. That's a really interesting point, James. And we're gonna talk later about sense of belonging and sense of identity and what role that plays in the cognitive side. So the non-cognitive abilities and how they feed into the cognitive side. Um, so to Christina's point, we're actually gonna start with funding. So Faith, I'll let you take it away. Thank you both Michelle and Christina for bringing this up. So I don't think that's surprising to any of us that funding is a factor in this divide. Funding is often a factor across educational issues. So of course it pops up here as well. Um, funding is one of the more complex factors, especially in terms of higher education. Uh, in K-12 education, it's usually done on a state-by-state -state basis and the same thing holds true for higher education. I think it's also noteworthy that while it varies state-by-state, -state, it also varies on an institutional basis, especially with the differences in between public and private universities and colleges. Um, state leadership holds a huge impact on what amount of budgets uh, will be dedicated to public colleges and universities, something that was actually highlighted between 2008 and 2018 for Arizona specifically. Um, lawmakers cut state support for public colleges and universities by approximately 56%. And this is very notable because that's a significant amount of the budget. If you look at the chart that I actually have up on this slide as well, you'll see that roughly 37% of university funding comes from state or federal spending. And if you're going to take away 56% of that 37%, you're left with a much smaller piece of the pie, which puts um, a lot more pressure on universities to find other ways to fund any programs that they may be offering. And that can also be restrictive in terms of how they're addressing divides like the digital divide. Um, so when schools are looking to address the digital divide, it's obvious that it's going to require a lot of different resources and a lot of different program offerings to reach the students that they need to reach. Um, it's not something that you're going to simply solve by giving them a book or anything. You're going to need to provide a device and access to how you can use that device as well as access to knowledge on what skills they may need. Um, and since that kind of can shape the funding opportunities that they have, universities are then required to consider how else they can pursue funding. So when universities look towards how else they can pursue funding, oftentimes politics or philanthropic enterprises come up. Um, the issue with both of those is that oftentimes by putting university resources like time and energy and staff and faculty 
to pursue other funding opportunities. It takes away time, energy, and resources that could be contributed to solving issues like the digital divide. Obviously, solving the issue of funding education is not something that I can address in one slide, but it is notable that it really contributes to how universities are able to solve existing issues for their students, especially in times of the pandemic when they're juggling so many different um, balls that all contribute to this one issue. Okay, so another factor that contributes to the complexity of the digital divide is policy. Um, there are some policies that hinder the closing of the digital divide and then some concepts circulating this space that could potentially help close the digital divide. So first I kind of want to talk about one that kind of has hindered that. Um, in 2010, a national broadband plan was launched. Um, this had a goal to provide every household in the nation with internet speeds fast enough to provide basic internet browsing and light streaming, which is around four megabytes per second. Um, and this number is way outdated now um, because some metro areas run on a thousand megabytes per second. So the reality of a plan such as this one is that the communities with the fastest speeds are most likely to benefit from competition among providers, which further pushes prices down. So dense high income communities will have multiple choices for affordable gigabyte services, while less dense lower income communities may still be stuck with an offering that's slower, but similarly priced, inequitable again. Um, the next point I wanna make is a newer policy idea that's circulating the literature based on this type of work. Um, and that is to provide tax incentives for businesses and firms subsidizing their employees broadband. So this type of thing would encourage businesses to provide their employees with the necessary materials to work from home successfully. So that's something really important to consider. And in conjunction with that, another policy idea that might help close the digital divide is to allow cities to provide their own broadband connections. Um, most state laws currently restrict cities from doing this um, just because of government provisioning, um, which restricts competition and ultimately just hurts local community efforts. However, an initiative like this exists in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, where the city has deployed its own electric power board or EPB um, of Chattanooga a municipally owned utility. So much to the despair of Comcast and Time Warner Cable, the typical duopoly cable for provider and telecommunications company, um, the EPB now provides citizens of Chattanooga with one um, gig broadband speed, plus TV services all for a $70 monthly plan. Um, and this EPB has caused the whole city of Chattanooga to transform itself into this um, amazing buzzing tech hub. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Bailey. So just a quick summary um, from Faith and Bailey. They've discussed some of the possibilities that institutions have to think about how to help their students. So um, Faith from a funding perspective and then Bailey from a policy perspective. And of course, universities and colleges don't always have, in high schools or whatever education entity, don't always have jurisdiction um, over the things that they need to in order to help their students and their families with all of the comp um, complex components of the digital divide, um, but providing laptops as in this picture here and as ASU has done providing hotspots. Um, and I think also thinking about possibilities, another one is partnerships. So institutions like ASU partnering with companies or um, corporations like Starbucks, for example, I'm not saying they will do this or are doing this, but if as Bailey suggested, a company that we partnered with was to provide tax incentives uh, or be provided tax incentives to help their employees connect to the internet, that wouldn't only benefit their ability to work from home, but if they're partnering with ASU or another institution to provide education as a benefit, it would also help their employees have access, another piece of access um, to their educational onla online educational opportunities. So it all connects in a way back to the higher ed institution or other educational institution. However, there are also limits, and a lot of those limits are around the more personal conditions that students face. Yeah, so all students have different circumstances, as we know, that can impact the time and money uh, that they can dedicate to their education. We all have different combinations of family and home circumstances, economic and work situations, and senses of identity and community um, that affect how we feel about technology whether we're able to access technology and whether we have the ability and skill set to effectively use that technology. So um, I think there are individuals in our audience um, as well as individuals who we follow who are not in our audience 
um, who know this and who teach this and spread the word on this. Um, and so we're happy to have you here and we're happy to share these examples for those of you that want to learn more um, from the people that we consider experts or that we like to learn from. Um, so I'll just briefly run through the four of these. There are more. And as I said, there are definitely a few of you in our audience that um, we would love to learn from as well. So Ajita Talwalker Menon is um, the president and CEO of Calbright, which is a new online community college in the California community college system. And she recently came to ASU to deliver a talk on this really complex undertaking that she's taken to create a digital community college for the learners that historically haven't been served by the typical community college experience. Um, and it was interesting because we brought her in to talk about this digital undertaking, but a lot of her talk, if not most of it, was focused on the non-digital aspects of being able to help her students, her learners, her families engage with the digital resources that their college provides. So she talked about this concept of the perfect storm, um, if you will, of the pandemic. So compounding health, compounding economic and educational challenges that these families and learners experience. And so these wraparound student services have become um, their focus in addition to the digital services that they're providing. Um, Larry Cuban is an educational historian who wrote, wrote a recent book and has done a lot of work on this idea of education technology as disruptor. Um, so thinking about, is our education actually disrupting um, the classroom or you know, the college lecture hall? Um, he does most of his work in K through 12. Um, but is it actually disrupting or how are teachers actually integrating it into their practices? So this idea of it's not just the technology alone, but the community of practitioners, whether that's teachers or college educators who are then charged with integrating it into their own practices and that community of practice and professional development that needs to go alongside it. Um, you'll, I figure most of you are aware of Khan Academy and Salman Khan is the founder. And for a long time, he was one of these disruptors of education, you know, claiming that students will spend all their time doing lectures, for example, in something like Khan Academy, and then spend all their classroom time um, doing more active learning. So it's that adaptive active combo. Um, but he recently opened up a school and has been quoted as saying, wow, this is a lot more complicated, um, a lot more complex than I than you know it sounds in theory. And since then, his own school, like the Khan Lab, Khan Academy Lab School, now uses their um, online intervention one day a week and then the other four days a week um, doing more traditional classrooms. So it becomes a complement um, rather than actual, actually disrupting. And then we mentioned Justin earlier, and I'll just share a little bit of the work that he's done with various colleagues. Um, some of you have mentioned his colleagues that are on this work. Um, so MOOCs, um, coming back into higher education specifically, um, were a, a, one of these other sort of disrupting the digital divide, um, new technologies or technological interventions. The idea was if we can open up our online courses to anybody uh, massively, massive online open courses, then we can close the divide by allowing anyone to enroll and take these courses. Um, and so early work kind of showed, well, the people who are engaging are actually from more affluent countries if you look at it globally. So it's not closing the global gap as much as you might think it would. Um, a little later on, there was more work showing that the, these black dots here are the actual enrollees um, in edX, which is one of the various platforms for MOOCs. And the gray is all of the United States. This is median income. The median income of those enrolled um, tends to be much higher than the median income of the United States um, overall. And so you're seeing, and also the their years of educational attainment are much higher than the US overall. So those who are already educated, those who are already affluent are the ones that are benefiting, benefiting from MOOCs um, rather than disrupting and democratizing access to higher ed. Um, now it's not all gloom and doom, like there's been questions about, well, how do we close the gap? And is the gap because lower income individuals or lower in lower HDI countries don't have internet, don't have devices. And it's a both and. So yes, we need to help with devices, but there are also other, as Jasmine noted, you know, personal circumstances, community identity circumstances. So this was a study um, published in Science more recently where they did an intervention around what 
is it, you know, be between social belonging and affirmation or affirmation, sorry, um, that is affecting how students persist and complete MOOCs. Um, so they held, you know, what was not changed here was access to technology. So, you know, we note that that's possibly an effect, but now we're testing, is there an additional effect around belonging and, and identity? And indeed they found that students who were asked to, for example, take a few moments to reflect on how the course aligned with their own values or who were given an intervention to repetitively affirm their participation um, found greater persistence over time. Um, and then that that persistence continued to be shown when they replicated the experience uh, the experiment later on. So it's a social um, and as well as a technological problem. Um, so again, all of this is not to say that we're techno uh, pessimists. Um, we're not, I guess that's what a lot of people think is the opposite of being a techno optimist. Um, but instead we kind of see it as we have a bunch of mindsets and practices that we like to put into place in our own work to expand access to education and to use science and technology to do that. And Jeff, yes, techno determinist as well. We, we wouldn't identify that way either. Um, so how do you keep operating in this space where you know that technology is an important tool, um, but you know that it's not the silver bullet solution to the issues that you're interested in? And so, you know, how might we integrate that understanding into the work? And again, it's a both and. So yes, we need technology and science. Um, and we're just gonna end, end our presentation today by sharing a few of the mindsets that we use in our office when we approach our projects in this space. Um, and I'll let the students kick us off with that. Yeah, so we know that challenges must be defined, investigated, and addressed through a multi-sector, multidisciplinary, and multi-experienced um, approach in teams. So a great metaphor for this type of work is bobsledding, um, sticking with the whole winter games theme of this whole conference. A bobsled crew has a team has team members who all have very specific jobs and they work together in order to, to succeed. Um, another team sport that we kind of correlated our work to is hockey, um, which may be a bit more violent than bobsledding, but it's also reflective of the diversity of skills and responsibilities that we take on in our office um, in order to accomplish really some tricky goals. So we thought these metaphors worked because bobsledding or bobsledding, number one, um, the teamwork enables agility and speed, and hockey, number two, um, teamwork relies on many people doing many different things across the entire ice rink. So a real-life project done by our office that we think aligns with the bobsledding metaphor is um, we were able to aid libraries in researching and cataloging options for digital adaptions to COVID um, in order to sustain their K through eight reading practices and literacy. Um, so for this project- There might be reasons. <laughs> Sorry guys. Um, so because of this, we needed to move really quickly and we worked as a team to do so. So we had listeners, people reading and con conversating and um, watching, um, et cetera, et cetera. We had ideators identifying um, the overlap between challenges and innovations. Um, many of these were technological and digital. Um, and we had resources as well. Um, and then finally we had communicators or relationship sustainers convening with and sharing information with the libraries themselves. And a real life example of the hockey metaphor was um, our up and coming graduate immersion program in our office. And um, this is launching this semester. So in this program, we bring in specific um, expert driven projects that are in development by grad students. And we're all gonna work together to improve them by bringing them under the scrutiny and guidance of um, our inter interdisciplinary team. So we are on the lookout for the scientization and and or technologization of social and political issues, which is looking for places where we might be trying to substitute science and technology for what is actually policy and design work in some cases. Um, the metaphor that we have here is ice skating or ice dancing, depending on what you call it. And what we're going to talk about briefly is in this case, um, in recent years, they've been trying to assign mathematical scores to what many consider an art form. And this certainly can be done based on techniques and technical elements of a performance, but it's never going to be a perfect grading system as evidenced by longstanding bias and judging. A recent study found that skaters received significantly higher technical merit marks when known, although their artistic marks did not differ. So these findings suggest that reputation bias does exist when judging figure skating, and that is present during the evaluation phase of the sports performance appraisal. 
So it's important when you're looking at figure skating to remember that it's both a sport and an art form, which can make it challenging to identify a perfect way to judge the sport. Now, if flipping over to our office and what a real life example might look like, um, we're going to use the idea of technology and policy versus sport and art. So we ensure our students understand the reality of bias and how it can be incorporated into algorithms and practices, even unknowingly. Um, recently, we looked at a algorithm that was supposed to be unbiased to determine whether loans for housing uh, should be given through using this algorithm pro program and how might it eliminate bias or limit it at least uh, for BIPOC clients. However, many of the algorithms are actually still based on systems that are in and of themselves biased against these very same clients because they rely on credit scores and other input measures that are within the system of inequities. And unfortunately, even though we're trying to address it and say that technology can minimize this by not looking at the client themselves, but looking at these other elements, what's the issue is that it's a systems problem and the system that surrounds this issue has yet to be solved. So our office has science, technology, policy, and design all within our mission statement because we know that problems can be all types and it's not an issue of it being a technology issue or a policy issue, it's a technology and policy issue. So something that's also important to our office to always consider when introducing new innovations is what is being created and what is being destroyed. So for example, on the left, we see professional curlers in a curling match and on the right, we see Curly the robot. Curly takes in data about the temperature and surface of the ice in order to uh, curl just as well, if not better than professional curlers. Now, if Curly can play a better game than the professionals, then why don't we just replace all humans with Curly robots? It's a pretty easy question to answer, right? It'll be super boring. There's an added element of enjoyment um, when you have humans competing rather than watching a machine uh, compete perfectly every time. The inventors of Curly created a perfect creation. However, if Curly was to replace professional curlers, it would destroy the fun of the game. There are many other more serious cases that we can probably think of uh, where technology could be optimized to perform a previously human task, uh, but we always have to consider what would be the human backlash or displacement? What are the possible unintended consequences? This is something that we consider in our office, uh, particularly as we participate in ASU's membership in the Rework America Alliance. The Rework America Alliance is a nationwide collaboration to enable unemployed and low-wage workers to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic with a stronger skill set so that they're able to move into good jobs in the digital economy. It's important to consider how our innovations and solutions affect people's ability to work and also their enjoyment of that work. Um, our office aims to keep an eye out for unintended consequences of well-intentioned inventions. We need to be aware of what's being created, but also be aware of what's being destroyed. Collaborating with others can help us better evaluate our innovations that we can mitigate negative unintended consequences. Um, so to do this, we build co coalitions by listening to and helping others. And collaboration and inclusion create a fuller understanding of the problem and how we can go about solving it. Our office attends um, webinars. Sorry, my voice is going bad. And ASU sponsored events and hosts meetings and informational interviews with community members so we can understand the multiple aspects of the problems and points of view within our community. So we also strive in our office to get the problem right. And we do this by always asking ourselves, what are the components of the problem and which could be levers of change or action? And we always wanna think about the end outcomes at the beginning. So some ways we do this is we have a weekly article club that allows us to consistently cultivate that learner's mindset. Um, we engage in conversation and collaboration around a certain topic or current event. And even outside of our article club, we consistently share articles, information, et cetera, um, that apply through our, to our mission um, through various Slack channels with different um, titles and topics. Um, our office is also planning on hosting what we call a policy lunch to help us better understand the policy or design landscape that these challenges are situated within. Um, lastly, to get the problem right as a first step, when we have a concept for a project, we're encouraged to reach out to other faculty and staff and students at ASU who have already done this sort of work um, and or community members and organizations that might be worth partnering with for this project. And um, this is a crucial step in the way we go about our projects, um, which in my opinion drives us all towards a more socially embedded mindset just in general. As our office considers about getting problems right, we also have to ask ourselves, how might we ensure our innovations are expanding equity as opposed to replicating bias or enforcing historical inequities? 
we must consider how we might frame or rethink existing technologies and innovations that are used to move towards greater equity. So one of the practices that our office actually incorporates to help combat this and to help us consider how we're reframing and rethinking existing innovations is through empathy interviewing, a concept that we actually borrowed from design thinking. Empathy interviewing in our office involves interviewing leaders across ASU and the community, as well as speaking with other stakeholders. And their responses help to illuminate how existing innovations impact the community and how we might further address those issues of equity by reframing what that innovation is or rethinking how we could implement it. Um, I think it's also important to note that after interviewing people and after having this idea of what the issue is, we begin to build proposals and ideas with systems reform in mind. Our office has design, policy, science, and technology in our mission statement because we believe that it is important to work with all aspects of a problem and all aspects of the potential solution that we're going to pitch. Um, according to John Alick, a leading policy technology consultant and scholar, inequities in American education, income, health, and opportunity have deepened for many reasons. One being the substitution of science and technology policy for meaningful policies to help foster the creation of jobs and industries in the US. What this ultimately means is that workers and families do not share in the science and technology prosperity that America has because other foundational policies to support basic needs like, ed like education and opportunity that he mentioned are lacking. And for us to better address those, we need to go back and think about how we can reframe existing policies and innovations that are in place. For us to best serve the community that surrounds us and that is mentioned in ASU's charter, it is imperative that we think how to leverage existing innovations to move towards greater equity. So to sum all of that up, uh, just as technology alone is not the only answer to the digital divide, um, we know that our ideas alone are not enough to create the window of opportunity to address those challenges. Um, so that's why we kind of bring into practice this idea of looking at what are the opportunities for collaboration, what are the opportunities for listening, what are the opportunities for inclusive design, um, because all of those things together feed into creating a window of opportunity and reflecting on when that window of opportunity might arise um, for us to actually address challenges and try to implement and test solutions. Um, so we welcome you at this point. That's pretty much all we have in terms of for us to share with you what we do, but we'd also like to invite you to share some of the practices in your work um, that you put into place for dealing with this complex or, you know, being aware of rather the complexity of the problem and how you address challenges. Um, and so we have kind of two ways to do that. You could just share some of your practices in the chat, um, or we like to use this um, thing called I used to think but now I think and it doesn't have to be about I used to think before this presentation but maybe something you used to think a while ago but now after your experience in your own work um, or your own challenges something that you've changed about how you work um, that might be helpful to others in this presentation and we'll, we're comfortable with a little silence so we'll give you a little bit of time to think about it um, before we um, wrap it up Oh, Michael, that's a good question. Students, do any of you want to take that? I'll be happy to take it since it was my slide. Um, so initiating an empathy interview is actually something that we covered in our onboarding process for student innovation analysts. And oftentimes it begins by actually asking around our own office and seeing if um, staff or faculty or even fellow students know someone who could answer the questions that we're posing. Um, if they do, then we are usually lucky enough to have an introduction email, and that is so helpful. However, if you don't have a connection to someone that you want to connect with, we oftentimes do cold emails where we explain what we're looking for, what questions we have, and overwhelmingly those emails have gotten a positive response of people within the community and ASU being willing to talk about their experiences that connect to whatever uh, questions we are asking. As to how you conduct them, we usually ask the questions over Zoom. Um, a Zoom conversation is something that I think we've all gotten more comfortable with during this time. In normal days, I'm sure we would have done in-person meetings and tried to have a more um, conversation that was just kind of organic. But when you come into Zoom, usually we have a list of questions that we prepare and that we go ahead and ask. For introducing it to the community, I think that's a question that Michelle is probably more suited for answering. 
Um, and first, just to Callie an answer your question as part of faith, um, we, yes, in the pandemic, um, for example, in the library's research that Bailey mentioned, um, we have just a connection through Teach for America where we're able to talk with several teachers through that network. So we utilize, as Faith said, some of our existing networks and that takes time um, to build and it's kind of an institutional knowledge and community knowledge that our office has built over time. Um, and then we have to call them um, or do Zoom interviews remotely. And um, I have done a couple for another project that I do feel it does change the dynamic because you don't get as much of that observational component. Um, and some of my work um, interviewing science and technology policy administrators, it is actually important to like see how they interact in their office settings and you know to go to them and experience their environment. That context is important. And it's unfortunately something that we miss out in the remote environment, but we do the best we can for the name of safety, public health. Um, and then what was the other question? How do you introduce this to the community? Um, Michael, would you maybe clarify what you mean introducing um, the idea of the interview or the results of the interview? I think my uh, question was answered there about uh, it's part of the onboarding process. Do, they can learn to expect this. Yeah. Um, and then we have some really interesting suggestions in from Caroline, from James and others. So thank you um, for sharing those. Um, in the interest of time, we're totally going to download this chat, by the way, and we'd love to, we'll have our email at the end, and we'd love to converse and connect with any of you and, and learn from you further on this after the presentation. Um, but just real quickly to conclude it so we can have a few more Q&A, um, we're just going to zoom back out to our chairlift concept. Um, and, you know, as Faith said, we're now at the peak. So, you know, thinking about what we saw on our way up. Um, the trees, the rocks, the contours of the path, the snow drifts, um, taking it all in to be mindful of what we'll encounter on the descent or on, on our um, quest to address the challenges. And it's not only what we see, but also where what we don't see um, and what we don't know we're going to um, encounter maybe behind those snow drifts. Um, and there's things that we can navigate around like a tree, but there might be things that we have to change and think about the cost of fighting for that change um, on the way down. Um, and so some of those things will remain hard. And But the point is that when you're aware, um, you're going to have a safer um, and better descent down the mountain. Um, so thank you for bearing with me as a non-pun uh, inclined person uh, plays into the Winter Games uh, pun fest. <laughs> um, so thank you all. And I'll let Bailey wrap it up. Yeah, so lastly, we just want to thank you all so much for spending your time with us today to learn more about the digital divide. Um, Michelle is going to drop our office's contact information into the chat in case you want to continue this really awesome conversation. Um, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your time at the Winter Games. Um, I think we're going to stick around a little bit longer just in case anyone has any questions, but yeah, you're free to go if you want to. Thanks, guys. And feel free to post those in chat or to speak up. So let's give one more round of applause to our tremendous presenters. Thank you all for joining us during this session and thank you to Ashley Gornitz for co-hosting the session. Next up is lunch. Uh, we encourage you to join our virtual lunch ro lunchroom for rapid twists and turns through the shaping EDU and connective project landscapes. Here is the link to join.